Maryland. Before we get started, I should say we are recording this webinar and it will be posted on the Nextdoor website. And good afternoon. I'm the co-host this afternoon, Joe Post from the FAA. We're your hosts for this inaugural Nextdoor webinar on the pandemic and air transportation. For background, Nextdoor was established in 1996 as an FAA Center of Excellence in Aviation Operations Research. It initially included four core universities, but over time expanded. In 2011, it transitioned to Nextdoor 2, an FAA consortium in aviation operations research that included and now includes eight universities, Georgia Tech, George Mason University, MIT, Ohio State, Purdue, UC Berkeley, the University of Maryland, and Virginia Tech. It, re it recently was renewed one more, once more, becoming Nextdoor 3. We are pleased to bring together academic researchers with industry and government leaders to examine the impact of COVID-19 crisis on our industry. We will examine the crisis, crisis through several lenses, the first being that of the airline industry. We have with us today three distinguished speakers. John Heimlich, Chief Economist, Airlines for America. Brian Pierce, Chief Economist, International Air Transport Association, joining us from Geneva. And Michael Lindenberg, Airline Equity Research, Deutsche Bank Securities. We also have a panel of academic researchers from the Nextdoor University Consortium. In addition to Professor Ball, we are joined by Lori Garrow, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech and Susan Hoddle, Assistant Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Virginia Tech. We will begin with short talks by each of our three invited guests. After each talk, we will take a few questions. Then, after all speakers have concluded, we will have a panel discussion. I will moderate, and the academics will be able to ask questions directly of our speakers. You in the audience will be able to ask questions via the Zoom Q&A feature. Our, our apologies in advance if we are unable to address all the questions. We will also conduct a series of audience polls during the webinar using the Zoom polling feature. As you will see, the questions deal with your perceptions of the risk of flying right now and your likelihood to fly in the future. The results will be presented right after the polling. So with that, we will bring up our first poll. There it is. What would it take for you to fly across the country to visit friends or family? And you can see your choices. I've already flown. I haven't flown, but I'm ready to go. Flattening of the curve at my origin and destination. Very substantial reduction in COVID cases or zero or close to zero cases, or finally a vaccine. I see that the answers are coming in quickly. All right, we'll give it a, a few more seconds. All right, what do you think? That's, a, I guess- Well, I'll, let's wait another second, because I don't, I think. Okay. Okay, I guess we'll close it now. All right, we'll close it. There we go, look at that. 35% uh, of you said the mode is a very substantial reduction in COVID cases across the country. Um, the second most popular answer is flattening of the curve at the origin and the destination. Uh, very few people um, have flown or um, are ready to go now. So it's, I think, very interesting. But most people not, not, not feeling the need to wait for a vaccine. Okay. Um... All right, let's go to the next one. All right. OK, 
considering the end-to-end -end risk of air travel, which do you feel carries more risk? Traveling to and from airports, proceeding through the origin and destination airports, and boarding and disembarking the aircraft, or sitting on the airplane, say, for two or plus more hours. So possible answers are traveling to and from the airports and et cetera, et cetera. So everything from, um, you know, before you get to the gate, uh, the flight is riskier than all other aspects of my travel, and they're about the same. All right, I think we'll end that. So uh, as you can see, the winner is uh, the flight is riskier than all as other aspects of the travel, uh, 44%. Uh, but uh, the second most likely, um, the second highest was they're about the same. Um, so uh, yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, certainly it looks like everyone thinks both are fairly risky. You're equivalent, I don't know if fairly risky the right word, equivalent risk, but uh, uh, certainly everyone is concerned about both those aspects with maybe the flight itself being a little more, of a little, of a little greater concern. Okay. All right, with that, we'll, uh, we'll go into our first presentation, right? Brian Pierce from IATA. Brian, take it away, share your screen. Okay, um, let's have a look. Right, okay, thank you very much and um, good afternoon, everybody. Those are a very interesting pair of polls. Let me just comment very quickly on that because 50% of you uh, thought that um, or, or felt that, um, that actually sitting on a plane was uh, riskier. Uh, than, than traveling and the, the observation I would make is because you know, we, we've been looking very closely at the number of cases you're know, tracking the cases that have been taking place and uh, our medical advisory group have only actually managed to record something like 20 cases of transmission of COVID-19 while on board aircraft you know out of the what 13 million cases worldwide um, uh, it's not peer-reviewed science, but um, you know the evidence does seem to suggest that there's actually not a, a huge risk um, um, on board. But anyway, that's not the subject of my presentation, which is about really about the global perspective. Um, uh, the first poll, um, you know, you pointed to wanting to see a flattening of the curve um, and a substantial reduction in the number of COVID cases, and, and this chart here shows the number of new cases of COVID-19 um, and whereas we have seen a very obviously in China we're down very close to zero give or take the few outbreaks that we've had but it's still very low and indeed outside of the US uh, in the developing economies it's also uh, very low but of course we do have um, the exceptions in uh, the rising cases in, in the US and also in uh, a number of key emerging economies and together you know those economies with uh, rising cases and the US that represents about 40% of global air travel markets uh, measured by R RPK so you know that that's pretty significant so you know until we get a vaccine you know that is until we see those curves flattening that's going to be um, driving a pretty slow recovery um, in air travel and you know, consequently, what, if, if you look at the travel restrictions that are in place around the world, they are still pretty extensive. Um, you know, although as economies start to unlock, we see domestic travel um, starting to rise, you know, most borders are still closed to international travel. Um, we have seen the emergence of 
um, neighboring countries opening up their borders for travel. We've seen travel corridors in Europe. Um, we've seen some Asian countries talking about travel bubbles and green lanes. Um, but, um, you know, that's all we're seeing internationally. And I think transcontinental travel, long haul travel is really going to be the last to recover. And it really does depend on, on those uh, tra trajectories. Um, you know, as an example, Australia, which almost eliminated, I mean, they're going through a second wave now, but they'd almost eliminated COVID-19, essentially said that they would uh, close international borders for travel, air travel, until next year. Um, so what we've seen is although um, in May, we saw quite a significant rise in business confidence, in the confidence of the business sector around the world, quite a substantial rise in May as a number of economies unlocked their economies. But as you can see, we didn't see a similar rise in air travel globally. We saw some rise, um, but the low point um, in April, we saw global revenue passenger kilometers flown or revenue passenger miles flown down 95% from where they were last year. In May, they were down 91%. Um, so there was an improvement, not very much. Um, so the, you know, the fact that we've still got those borders closed is restricting uh, the improvement that we, we're seeing. So just digging a little bit deeper in what we saw in May, um, you can see that bunch of lines right at the very bottom, you know, all of the international regions essentially saw no growth. Uh, between, you know, in, uh, there was no improvement between the low point April and May for international air travel. Um, the growth that we did see was domestic. Um, China's been, over, been unlocked for a few months now and uh, uh, air travel in domestic markets in China is, is roughly half uh, down on where it was last year. And there was a little bit of growth in the US and there was some growth certainly in some other Asian domestic markets, but nothing uh, internationally. Um, and as well as the travel bans, the closed borders, there's another policy issue that has been constraining um, international air travel, and that has been quarantine. Uh, because um, we had a number of economies um, opening up their markets in April uh, for air travel, but requiring quarantine of 14 days. Um, as you can see by comparing uh, the, the blue bars where um, markets were opened, um, but, and, um, but there was a quarantine, you had a very similar decline to markets um, in a similar region with full travel bans. Uh, some of those numbers are bigger than uh, one hundred percent because th th these are um, sales of tickets net of refunds that have been uh, that have been taking place, but as I say you know essentially a quarantine um, in practice uh, turns out to be the same as a full travel plan people don 't want to travel in those circumstances um, we 've been looking at uh, you know because it's been a fast changing situation, we've been, we've been looking at higher frequency data and, and we've, the flight data that is available, the, the data showing aircraft movements gives us a, a sort of much more timely view of activity on domestic and international air transport markets. Uh, and as you can see from this chart that, you know, we, we know there was an improvement in May from the low point in April and the flight data suggests that that slow improvement uh, continued in June and the early part of July. But again, again dominated by growth domestically, you know, we still have this problem of uh, travel restrictions. Um, there was a bit of a rise um, in July in, in international, and that reflected um, what we saw happen in the Schengen region of the European Union, where that region opened its borders, um, and we saw quite a substantial uh, rise in, in, in travel, but only within the Schengen region, only within the European region. Uh, it, Europe, the European Union, Schengen region opened its borders to uh, markets outside, but there wasn't um, any rise in travel, at least there hasn't been so far. 
that relatively slow improvement you know, contrasts really interestingly with what we've seen happen uh, in the broader economy to business confidence, the confidence of the business sector, which has rebounded, you know, as economies have unlocked, confidence amongst businesses has been has rebounded pretty strongly. You know, China back to where it was before. Um, and indeed, you know, these numbers are fairly well correlated to GDP growth. And we saw the Chinese economy growing um, 3% or so up on a year ago in the second quarter. Now that's well down on their normal rates of growth, but you know, their economy is expanding once more, consistent with this rise in business confidence. And as you can see, businesses are similarly, have seen a similar improvement in confidence. Um, so GDP growth should rise. Now, air travel, cargo, uh, typically is you know, closely correlated, driven by that economic activity. You would think, given the rise in business confidence here, we'd see um, you know, a significant rise in business travel. Actually, that is not expected. Um, and the survey evidence suggests that there has been quite a behavioral change um, in business travel. Um, we'll obviously have to see how that pans out in practice. Um, but we, we've been doing a series of surveys of around about 5,000 passengers in 10 countries. Um, each month and this latest survey here is from the survey we did in early June. Um, what I would say is that uh, when we did the survey in April, um, the people saying that they would travel or either not wait at all or wait just a month or two to return to air travel. Back in April that was a total of 60%. Um, what we saw in June actually that total had fallen to 45 percent uh, passengers consumers um, who traveled in the last year actually have become less confident and less willing to uh, fly st uh, straight away and i think that's borne out by um, the, the responses to the first uh, polling uh, question so there's you know there's clearly some pent-up demand but actually a lot of people are cautious and indeed if we look at broader measures of consumer confidence um, in the US, in the UK, in Germany, in China, um, there's been a bit of an improvement in China, but elsewhere, uh, you know, unlike the confidence of businesses, consumers are not confident at all. Um, and obviously, you know, there are expected to be substantial job losses. Um, you know, it's very difficult to see leisure travel, air travel for leisure purposes, picking up strongly in these sorts of, uh, these sorts of conditions. Um, another interesting behavioral feature, uh, or perhaps a behavior change of the last um, few months is in booking behavior. Uh, and these two bars compare Bookings uh, made in May last year and bookings made in May this year and uh, how far ahead of the travel date those bookings were made and back you know the typical pattern last year um, was that you know almost 50% of bookings were made you know 20 days um, in advance of travel and that allows airlines to schedule with some confidence. Um, as you can see, that's changed pretty dramatically. Um, you know, only 29% of bookings uh, for travel in May this year were made 20 days ahead. You know, more than 41% of bookings were made um, uh, on the day or just three days ahead. That makes um, you know, scheduling really difficult. You know, airlines have got very little visibility of forward uh, bookings and, and that's one of the reasons why there's been you know, a, a lot of uh, pressure a lot of requests for an extension of the, the waiver of slots use at congested um, airports. Um, I think one of the wider well, wider economic risks of the situation that we find ourselves in is that I think many cities might lose their connectivity their connections by air to other cities. 
Now, if we look at the, chart, the bar on the right, it, it's certainly true that the majority of passengers travel on trunk routes through direct connections. But you know, in terms of um, the connections available between cities, the vast majority of those are indirect. Um, and that's sort of economically quite important because of, uh, it's not just the spending of travelers, it's also the, the business connections for trade um, and investment, um, foreign direct investment, uh, headquarters, uh, etc. cetera. Um, so there are some economic risks here if we don't see that connectivity uh, restored. And you know, the trouble of course with indirect connections and uh, you know, hub and use of hub and spoke uh, networks is that a lot of these feeder routes, particularly internationally, are closed. Um, you know, that model is gonna be a pretty difficult one to pursue. And what we're certainly seeing at the moment is that it's point to point that is, that is uh, starting up. But as you can see uh, from the chart, you know, most city pairs across the world, you know, are just point to point is not, uh, is not viable for, for those markets. If you're in the cargo business, it's actually been a rather different experience to the passenger business where we essentially saw the passenger business stop in April. Um, the cargo business was down, we saw volumes fall 25, 30%, but not 95%. Um, and the other difference is that um, the cargo business saw half of the capacity um, that serves it grounded because typically half of their cargo volumes are transported in the bellies of passenger aircraft. So actually what we've been seeing in air cargo is a capacity crunch. Uh, freighters have been um, you know, massively utilized um, and you can see load factors have shot up, um, cargo rates have shot up, actually cargo revenues uh, are higher than they were uh, a year ago, um, amazingly. Unfortunately, that's not been enough to offset um, the fall, um, the disappearance of passenger revenues and turning to the financial impacts of this situation on on airlines. We, we did some work looking at the situation in the second quarter of, of this year and you've got you know, very limited revenue uh, globally and on the cost side, um, the, the, I mean the feature of the airline industry is that many costs, perhaps 40%, are very difficult to flex uh, over a short period. They, you know, some are fixed, some are semi-fixed, um, you know, certainly not avoidable even if the fleet has been parked. Um, so that brings the, you know, the industry into loss-making territory. But if we're looking at cash flows, another factor has been um, the liabilities for the tickets sold but not flown um, in the first half of the year, which totaled about $35 billion uh, by the second quarter of this year. So you know, cash burn, um, in the second quarter, we estimated it was probably around about $60 billion. And airlines typically had um, you know, not very much cash in the bank. Um, you know, it, other things being equal, uh, you would expect to see lots of airlines um, failing uh, given that rate of cash burn. But of course, we haven't seen that. We've seen some in Latin America. Um, but the reason, of course, being is that governments have stepped in, not least the US government, um, and provided very substantial amounts of cash to essentially keep the industry on life support. And as you can see, you know, we estimated, um, and this was an estimate we did in late May, uh, that there was more than $120 billion of cash from government support uh, that had taken, taken place. We've updated those figures, it's probably about $150 billion uh, by now. And as you can see, quite a variety of ways in which governments have been supporting the industry. Uh, loans, uh, wage subsidies, uh, a very important element, but you know, also um, you know, deferral of, uh, of taxation and some interesting cash injections. The Hong Kong government have actually made forward purchases of tickets 
which is actually quite an interesting way of supporting uh, operating cash flow as airlines start to operate. But I think the consequence of, of this is that um, the, the, the bars in dark blue are either debt or reimbursable, their costs that will have to be paid. So essentially what's happened is that the industry is moving into, as, it, as economies unlock and borders open, airlines start to fly again, they've actually got an awful lot of debt to service and of course repay. Um, and on top of government um, debt uh, through the aid that's been given, uh, airlines have been out, at least the larger airlines have been out getting cash to secure the liquidity that they think they would need. But the, the consequence of that has been we've seen debt rise from 430 billion at the end of last year to probably, you know, sort of 550 or approaching 600 uh, billion. And obviously the cash flows to support that uh, are just not, not there. Um, and the industry was not actually in a very strong place before the crisis. Um, if we look at airlines, and these lines show airlines in order of their economic profit, so there's about 120 um, airlines, that's the sort of, that's perhaps 80, 90% of the industry in terms of uh, traffic and revenues. You can see that the improvement in profits in the last 10 years, from 2008 to 2017, 18, has been driven only by about 20 or 30 airlines. A very small number of airlines have driven the industry's aggregate improvement in profitability. There's a very long tail of airlines that have more or less just stayed breaking even, or indeed are still substantially loss-making. So, you know, that 20 or 30 airlines you know, are still in pretty good shape, um, uh, although struggling, um, but they're, uh, they're, they're survivable. Large parts of the industry is not, it's very fragile. Um, and this is my last slide, um, ju just sort of looking at the sort of environment the airlines are likely to be operating in over the next few years. Um, you know, obviously there's a huge amount of uncertainty not least because we're not quite sure how COVID will behave, whether we'll see second waves. Um, we're certainly not expecting to see air travel returning to 2019 levels very quickly. Uh, the blue line here shows our baseline estimate. Um, you know, we think um, you know, we'll get back to 2019 levels globally by perhaps 23, 2024. Um, you know, this, this next year, you know, you'll certainly see some growth, but compared to the sort of levels that we were expecting before the crisis, the dotted line, you know, it's going to be down, um, you know, 30% or so. Um, and, you know, even five years out, it's probably still going to be down, you know, 15% or so compared to expectations. And as you can see, the risks are probably still on the downside. Um, so obviously there are consequences there for what airlines want in terms of uh, aircraft, i.e. much less. But it also means that the economics of the recovery period are going to be actually be pretty difficult um, because there's um, uh, you know, the, obviously a lot of capacity around. Uh, yields are likely to be low, um, but uh, unit costs are likely to be increased by low levels of aircraft utilisation, uh, the additional costs caused by the uh, by the health measures, and of course uh, the debt servicing costs. So as government aid tails off, particularly sort of wage uh, subsidies, there's a very significant risk that we're going to see either, uh, or perhaps, uh, well, we're so, significant risk of seeing substantial failures um, of airlines, or, uh, or perhaps plus, um, governments um, in a situation where they will have to swap the debt that they've given to airlines for equity, and we're going to end up with a lot more government-owned airlines in this environment. Um, and I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. We, we have uh, a couple of questions. Uh, 
I'm going to paraphrase the one um, you were just talking about, really, industry consolidation or industry um, failures. Um, can you, can, from your perspective globally, um, we'll probably ask John the same thing, but um, which regions are most uh, susceptible? We've seen some failures in Latin America. Um, yeah. Care to comment any, any more? Yes, um, because although uh, you know government aid has been very substantial, it's been very uneven. Um, you know, there's been a lot in um, uh, North America. There's been quite a lot in uh, Europe, but Latin America and Asia are very, uh, very patchy. Um, and even with that aid in um, in Europe, um, it's a very fragmented industry and a very fragile um, industry. So I'd expect to see. Um, you know, I, I think it's inevitable that we're going to see um, consolidation in some form or another. I think that, you know, unfortunately, failures are, um, are, are likely. Um, but we've also seen uh, airlines rash, uh, putting, putting a, 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 a more um, consolidated structure together through their relations. We saw Azul um, and Latam in the Brazilian market. This morning we heard uh, about um, uh, some arrangements between American and uh, Jet Jet Blue, so I think yeah, some some consolidation is um, is is inevitable. I think in this environment, um, we have uh, a question also from Mark Hansen at, at Berkeley about uh, attitudes toward business travel, um, specifically how. Uh, have many businesses decided that online meetings are, are more cost effective and will curtail business travel permanently? Yes, it's, um, it's you know, we, we, we've got a group of, um, of the major travel buyers um, and we've been talking to them quite, quite regularly. And, and certainly, you know, the anecdotal views are that there will be significant changes um, in, in business, business travel. Um, no, I'm always a bit a bit nervous about making statements like that because you know many times in the past we've said that business travel will be killed by video conferencing technology and it never has been. Um, but I do think that uh, certainly for a number of years we're going to see air travel curtailed. Um, obviously, there are the economic consequences and the, uh, the reductions in travel uh, budgets. Uh, but I think the the length of the lockdown and the experience people have had in doing this sort of uh, conference, I think is, um, is certainly making many businesses sort of reassess the need for some of the travel. I think 30% of business travel is to head offices or uh, regional offices. Um, you know, that's obviously something that could be cut, um, you know, probably quite easily and replaced with video technologies and that is a real issue for the industry because uh, a lot of the profitability of network airlines is driven by um, business business travelers particularly long haul travel um, you know the real issues of whether you know uh, some routes particularly some long haul routes will be financially viable um, without this, that support from uh, from business travel Thanks, I think we should move on. Uh, so we have two more polls. We'll try to do those quickly and the next speaker will be John Heimlich, but let's do our poll. Okay, our next poll question should be coming up. Or do I have to do something? Ah, there it is. We did that one, right? We're up to... Uh, or is this the one? Ah, yes. Okay. If you choose to fly in the next few months, will you take into account the risk mitigation strategies of each airline in choosing who to fly with? For example, leaving middle seats open, temperature checks, extra cleaning, etc. And we have a range of options regarding your, your, uh, your preferences in this regard. So they're coming in rapidly.
Hmm. Sector stabilizing. All right, let's uh, let's cut it off. Okay. Thank you. Look at that. Um, the, the, the number one answer by a small margin, risk strategies will be my primary criterion of choosing a carrier. Um, and between that and um, I will be somewhat cognizant of risk strategies. That's uh, overwhelming. Um, so clearly, uh, yeah, so clearly that's going to be very important to people. Um, you know, some it's, very, it's the most important and some the second most. So I think kind of that's a lesson for airlines for sure. Okay, the next poll. Did I? I guess we got that. Uh, we got that done simultaneously. It looks like. Oh, did we? Oh, geez. <laughs> can Can you put bring the results up? Or I can see them. So the sec the second the next one was: Do you feel that after the pandemic, business air travel will return to its prior levels, or will a new normal with less business air travel evolve? And the uh, the by and large the favorite answer 64 percent there will be a model there will be a modest long-term reduction in business air travel um, as opposed to a substantial long-term reduction or a uh, or it won't be affected um, so I think that's sort of consistent with what Brian was was saying yeah okay let's move on our next speaker is uh, John John Heimlich, he's the Chief Economist for Airlines for America. And John, you can take it away. All right, thank you. All right, we got to hustle here. Uh, okay, so similar chart to Brian's here, but a little uh, peeling the onion a little more on which countries. Uh, yesterday, I think we had an all-time high in the United States of positive cases. And what's very scary, of course, is the slope of that USA line. Very, very steep, uh, pretty much as steep as it was in the second half of March. And of course, Brazil seems to be flattening out a little bit. India is definitely on the, uh, the upward climb and China and Italy still have some cases trickling in uh, day to day, uh, but uh, nowhere near what we're seeing in the United States, okay? Uh, World economy, this is a concern. I mean, every major economy, the world is projected to shrink by standard and poor's uh, close to 4% this year, and that's shrink. With the only major economy growing being China, 1.2%. I think I had some decent news this morning or yesterday, but keep in mind, China in a normal year will be growing mid to high single digits. And USA projected to shrink 5%, that had been even higher. We'll see what the upturn the recent surge in COVID cases, and of course, anyone thinking about transatlantic, you've got the Eurozone in the UK, really basket cases here in Brazil, of course, and uh, you know, there's, gener there's a high correlation with the COVID cases or the relationship between those parts of the world and nations that do have COVID cases. And of course, S&P says here that, you know, the COVID's gonna remain a threat to the economy until we have a widely available vaccine or drug treatment. That could be the second half of 2021. <clears throat> In the U.S., this is just one particular forecast, but I think it's consistent with Brian's world outlook and definitely consistent with my view is it's going to be at least 2023 until we return to 2019 volumes. And that is just it. It's volumes. It's not revenue. Revenue will lag in part because of pricing pressure and, and the slow economic growth and in part because of the business mix uh, of travel being slower to come back and uh, international. So uh, in the US, just uh, through this past Sunday, we had passenger volumes down 74%. I think it's very clear here that domestic had led the recovery, but has recently flattened out uh, with the COVID resurgence. We'll see that in a number of different perspectives and bookings in a moment, uh, followed by uh, Mexico, and then uh, non-Mexico Latin, of course, there's a lot of VFR traffic and some vacation traffic in those places. VFR for this call is visiting friends and relatives, not visual flight rules. Notice how depressed uh, Canada, Pacific, and uh, Atlantic remain. So airlines have cut departures. 
they were back to half of their domestic daily flights uh, and uh, the fairly quick re restoration of capacity there. Now some of those are thinking of scaling back August. I think Delta was one example that said we're going to put back uh, half of what we thought we would in, in August. So they've scaled back their uh, August growth plans. And of course, domestic in Mexico and Latin uh, upturned sharply. And you see the same thing with some of those transoceanic without commensurate return and demand. So these may turn back down. What that's resulted in domestically uh, is a f when you have a capacity come back so quickly and demand stabilize or plateau, as uh, a better term for it, you have a falling number amount of onboard traffic. So we've had about 60 passengers per domestic flight, and this is blended mainline and regional. That was about 104 a year ago. Um, so that is very telling. On the uh, international side, we went from something like 236 Pacific passengers per flight uh, down to 70, and Canada's running about 23 per flight. So very empty planes. Uh, in general, and here you can see it very clearly how the uh, capacity decline, the traffic, there's a greater spread here between the traffic decline and the capacity decline. That clearly puts downward pressure on uh, load factor and it's accentuated in the past couple of weeks. Uh, the TSA lens, which is everything leaving a US airport uh, at the point of checkpoint and includes foreign flags, Again, you can see the plateau here, 666,000 yesterday. Travelers going through checkpoints, that is down 73%. Uh, if we look at a state that has a stricter quarantine policy, since March 26, state of Hawaii has had a 14-day quarantine for out-of-state arrivals. Uh, they are still down 94%. So not every part of the US clearly is equal. Uh, their quarantine obviously applies to other states and other countries. And I believe, if I heard correctly, they've extended the planned quarantine through August 31st. It was set to expire uh, July 31st. So really tough time in Hawaii. And Hawaiian Airlines was recently downgraded by S&P to a triple C plus credit. Booking suggests things are um, not going to get any better anytime soon. This goes out 330 days for future travel. And we had gotten into the 70s in terms of percentage decline for travel. But we are now at 80% in the, as of a week ago, down 80% in booked volume, down 91% in booked revenue. And that comes back to the comment I made about the mix of travelers. We do have some downward pricing pressure on fares, but we also have the fact that the people coming back to travel, albeit gradually, are of a personal nature, visiting friends and relatives and recreational. And uh, it's not the, the corporate traveler, or the international traveler. So revenue is lagging and revenue, not volume, is what pays the bills. You can clearly see here how it not only plateaued, but the re growth rates reversed. That is very concerning and it lines up with what we've seen with COVID rates. And here's the CDC map of uh, cases reported in the last seven days by state and territory. And uh, while the Northeast is under pretty good control, uh, the southeast, uh, southern, central, and southwest, and then all the way up in California are not doing so well in the past um, seven days. It's just not a pretty picture. And of course, it doesn't only affect travel to and from those states um, or travel in those states. It's travel in places like the tri-state area of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, which have a quarantine now on, I think, well over 16 states uh, on their list. So. Uh, it's really having a system-wide effect. Now on the cargo side, we have data from DOT through April for international. April was down 21%. If you peel the onion there, it was really Europe where we suffered. Obviously there was a big reduction in belly cargo and you had the so-called Schengen ban then expanded to the UK and Ireland, uh, down 44% in tonnage. Uh, idled aircraft, we started out the year with 5% of the active fleet. Park, that's about 6,156 6, active aircraft. 52% of those, we, that was what the peak on May 18, 52% of the fleet was parked, 3204 airplanes. To support the gradual recovery and restoration of capacity, airlines have brought some planes out of storage. So at the beginning of this week, they were just one third of the fleet was parked, or a little over 2,000 airplanes. What planes were parked the most? Well, fully retired, the MD-80s and MD-90s. Uh, the Saab 340s, and then generally speaking, 
larger wide bodies and slightly older wide bodies. So seven six triple seven, uh, even three thirties. The, the, the A two twenty is an aircraft that's suited very well to this environment, very efficient, and better suited to smaller demand marketplaces. Um, also, ones by the way that were um, still uh, uh, that were idled here are um, the older seven one seven. So. Um, one factor you might say, well, why are some airlines restoring more capacity than others? Well, one thesis is that it has to do with their aircraft ownership costs. If you're still paying for aircraft, you might be more inclined, inclined to deploy them and get some cash generation out of them, um, as opposed to, well, it's fully paid off, I can just park it and I have no opportunity cost there. So if you look at the percentage of active aircraft or percentage of stored aircraft, uh, that are under 10 years in the fleet in the July uh, database here, uh, American is the lead and they have indeed restored the capacity more quickly than other carriers. 59% of their active mainline fleet is uh, under 10 years old and 29% of their stored fleet. And then you see uh, Delta United Southwest. Here, uh, break even load factor last year, a somewhat normal year, 76% break even load factor for the US airlines. Uh, rose a little bit in the first quarter this year with weakening in the Pacific and we expect those break-evens to stay elevated through the remainder uh, of this year very challenging environment and lo and behold you have these very large losses uh, being reported uh, monthly cash burn uh, this is just one estimate I would take each of these plus or minus 500 million but basically um, second quarter average a little over six and a half billion per month uh, the, through the summer, we'd say at least $5 billion of cash burn per month. But most importantly on this slide, we still expect collectively the industry, the U.S. airline industry, to be um, burning cash through December. Um, and that is a, extremely challenging. And the way you cope for that is by uh, bringing debt to the table. And I quote uh, our cleanup hitter, Mr. Lindenberg here, who said that for 2021 and beyond, uh, the industry will have no choice but to address its significant cash load because if if your ATM is just being drained every single day and every month, the only way to cope with that as you get that cash burn rate down is to borrow money, sell assets, sell stock, sell leaseback transactions. That's a lot of debt to handle. 44% increase anticipated from the end of last year to the end of this year. Just a reminder to people who forget uh, after 9-11, it took probably almost four years for revenue to recover from pre-9-11 levels and the global financial crisis, it took about 10 years for volumes to, re sorry, seven years for volumes to recover. Uh, global in nature, uh, debilitating oil spike. On the cargo side, uh, the recession was under a year in 2001 and it wasn't global in nature and uh, we didn't have an oil spike. So that cargo recovered much more quickly. However, after the global financial crisis, subsequent oil spike, there was a bias toward uh, less time sensitive modes of transport. And this was a, a very a deep and slow to recover uh, economy. So uh, with that, I think I will uh, pause and, and turn it back to you, Jeff. Thanks, John. You're, you're very quick. Uh, all right, we, uh, Mike, you want to you want to take the uh, you want to form a question around uh, business jets and uh, yeah. So there were a couple questions. I, I think I'll try to combine them, but they they have to do with um, you know fractional jet service, business jets, etc. Um, I think there were two questions related to this, but to what degree do you see that? Um, set of services becoming more and more prof or prominent and maybe stealing away demand from the mainline air carriers? Uh, I mean, I see it as a, a modest, a modest threat. Um, I mean, you do have a little better control of your environment. Uh, it's not an inexpensive proposition to uh, expand your um, options there, whether it's a fleet you own or a fleet you, you rent through some fractional arrangement and, and pilots and whatnot. Uh, it, and uh, I'm not sure how the tax law has or hasn't changed with respect to all that, but um, 
you know, you're still obviously in close quarters on, on such an aircraft, but you have a little more control. I mean, I don't think that's widespread. Um, and it's not like, you know, if you're a large tech company, you, you, you know, which is where a lot of the growth has been in, in business travel or, or even an investment bank. I mean, it's, it's not like all your rank and file employees have access to that type of program. You know, that's reset, tended to reserve for a select number of individuals in the C-suite. So I don't see that as a, as a, as a large threat. Okay, thanks. John, we have a, a question uh, that, that comes up a lot in these things about the um, sort of passenger experience, quality of service. Um, will we see, um, will, will eventually everything go back to the way it was with, uh, with um, you know, small seat pitches, tight, tight uh, coach cabins and and uh, fair being king, or you know, can we, could we see a, a change in the business model? Um, well, I think for us, as long as you and I live, fair will be king for the majority of travelers. I don't see that changing. I mean, the premise of the question is everything got smaller and the only thing left was a tight pitch, but that's not the reality happened, except that structurally carriers with lower pitch like Spirit grew rapidly as a share of the industry. Same is true in Ryanair and EasyJet, right? That's what customers wanted the most. Those are the carriers that have grown the fastest because that's what the public demanded. There's a reason Spirit's order books were so robust prior to this pandemic. Uh, they plan to grow 15, 20% a year. What the larger network carriers did in response was to segment the cabin and they offered the same pitch as they did before in some classes. They called that premium economy. And then they developed a basic economy offering. Um, I don't think any, things are going to go, per quote, back to the way they were before. But I also don't necessarily say some of those things are going to change radically. There, there are different products for different people. Um, I think the ultra low cost carriers have ambitious growth plans. And I think there will always be a price sensitive clientele that values things like pitch less. And now having said that, um, you know, hats off to Spirit, they worked have closely with the seat manufacturer to develop a more comfortable seat product where pitch isn't the only measure of personal space or personal comfort. Um, but if you want something different, then, you know, you fly JetBlue or United or Delta or Southwest or Alaska and Hawaiian and other choices are out there. I think the same is true internationally. So um, I don't think we'll have radical changes, but you're definitely going to have changes. But I, you know, I'm sure we'll do surveys five years from now, 10 years from now, and we'll still see price and schedule are the most important thing because everyone's going to have to elevate their base of cleanliness. Thanks, John. Okay. Thanks. I guess we should move on. So our next. Uh, Presenter is Mike uh, Linenberg, who is a. Um, Do we have a survey? Do we have another survey? Oh, yeah, we have another survey. Sorry. <laughs> we don't have a survey. Yeah, we should have a survey. Yeah. No survey. All right, well, let's go on then, Mike. Okay, Mike uh, Linenberg, uh, he's from uh, Deutsche Bank. He's an investment analyst who specializes in the airline industry. Great, thanks um, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me loud and clear since I, my mugshot is not up on the screen. Um, I would say, um, you know, because of where we sit, um, which is in the middle of conversations among equity and debt investors, as well as the management teams of the companies we follow, our perspective is it's a slightly different one than, than what you just heard from, from Brian and John. And I would say, you know, when we say we, um, I say we as it's in the context of my employer, Deutsche Bank. Um, we are also directly responsible for covering airlines in the United States and Latin America, which, as most of you know, um, and just listening to John and Brian, those are two regions that have been equally devastated by COVID-19. Um, but what's interesting is that the airlines of those regions are incurring vastly different experiences, which we will touch on in, in a few minutes. Um, I plan to break up my presentation really into the three sections, and it's just to address sort of briefly the questions that are posed on the invitation of this webinar, which are, you know, what has happened, 
what have we learned and, and how to go forward. So turning to the first question or what has happened, it probably makes some sense just to give you some financial color for what we expect to hear from the US carriers as they report June quarter results. So we're gonna get a little granular here um, because that's what we focus on. Um, Shouldn't come as any surprise to anyone on this webinar that the June quarter will be one for the record books and not in a good way as we are anticipating negative triple digit operating margins, um, break even load factors for some carriers. I think on John's slide, the average for the industry is over 100%. We're going to have some airlines that are going to report break even load factors over 200%. And you're also going to see unit cost increases that are you know, north of 40, 50%. You know, that's what we've been telling investors to prepare for following the collapse in demand due to COVID-19. Now, putting numbers to words, we are forecasting that for the June quarter, we're going to see an 84% decline in industry top line. And that's with airline sales of only $7 billion compared to $47 billion a year ago. And that's going to drive a $17 billion pre-tax loss. You know, a year ago, we saw the industry produce a $6 billion pre-tax profit. So just the year-over-year -year swing of $23 billion, that represents a jaw-dropping 377% year-over-year decline. Now, so far, only one U.S. airline has reported June quarter results. That was Delta, which, as many of you know, it's viewed as one of the industry's strongest carriers. And yet, they still reported a negative 247% operating margin. That means, you know, just to put some context around this, for every dollar of revenue that they brought in, they managed to lose $3.50. Clearly not a sustainable situation. Now, we do believe that we saw the bottom in mid-April, and you know we saw that in both John and, and Brian's charts. Um, at that point, daily throughput, and this is in the US, was averaging just under 100,000 passengers per day. Now, a few weeks ago, we were on our way to 700,000, and it looked like that we were on a nice trajectory. You know, we would get to a million maybe by you know, the month of September. However, the recent move by New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut requiring visitors or returning residents from states with COVID-19 test rates exceeding 10% to self-quarantine for 14 days, clearly starting to impact bookings, and we suspect has driven up cancellations as well. So over the past couple of weeks, since the tri-state region first implemented their travel advisory, we're now up to 22 states. And I would have said, you know, we were actually at 23 states, but Delaware was removed from the list. So we look around the U.S. and just canvassing, you know, doing sort of a quick canvas of, of recent headlines. We believe that there's something on the order of about a dozen jurisdictions in the U.S. that have adopted a similar rule with Chicago being the most recent example, now requiring 14-day quarantines for visitors from states with high COVID-19 rates. And I think that went into effect a week ago. So these are just popping up left and right. So, you know, look, we did bottom out in April. You know, we do expect the demand recovery to be uneven as spikes in COVID-19 cases and the emergence of new hotspots dissuade travelers from returning to the skies. It's clearly not gonna be a linear uh, upswing. So what have we learned? You know, one of the things um, that I want to focus on here in what we learned, and of course, there's going to be a lot of things that we're going to learn through this process, but one of the things I want to clue in on is that airlines that have received the backing of their governments are likely to be far better off than those which have received little to no government support. And that's something that we saw, you know, Brian touch on with some of his slides. You know, as we alluded to earlier, we juxtaposed Latin America to the US, you know, that there was a different experience by US airlines versus their Latin American counterparts. Among the publicly traded Latin American airlines, we have already seen Aeromexico, Avianca, and Latam Airlines file for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection in the US courts. And for now, investors are assessing which carriers could be next. All one has to do is just look at the levels of the publicly traded debt, which for all of the carriers that have it, that is the Latin American carriers that have it, those securities are trading at distressed levels, which is typically less than 50 cents on the dollar. So not a lot of confidence in the marketplace, at least among debt investors. Now, we think it's important to note um, that the initial phase of support from the U.S. government for the U.S. airline industry, and what we're referring to here is the $25 billion 
$25 billion provided under the Payroll Support P Program, or PSP, which as many of you know, was uh, one of the key, uh, one of the many elements of the $2 trillion CARES Act. That initial phase was earmarked for the employees. This wasn't some subsidy or bailout to keep the industry afloat. This was to put money in the pockets of employees, even if they were being paid to stay at home. Like many of the CARES Act's programs, such as the Paychecks Protection Program, or what's been referred to as the PPP, these were meant to counteract what was expected to be an historical rate of unemployment driven by the massive disruption caused by COVID-19. The thinking was that by providing wages and salaries to employees, even when they're not working, that would allow them to have money to spend on goods and services, which would help alleviate the worst effects of the economic downturn. Also, the initial view was that the PCP for the airlines or the triple P for small businesses would be sufficient to get them to the other side. Fast forward to today, and it appears that COVID-19 will continue to be a major economic detractor for the foreseeable future, unless of course a therapeutic and or a vaccine becomes widely available. Now that said, we do believe the most important aspect of the $25 billion payroll support program and the complimentary $25 billion loan program for the US airline industry was that it, that it was perceived as a government backstop by the financial markets. This view has been reinforced by the fact that the US airlines have raised $37 billion of capital during the June quarter, which consisted of $32 billion of debt and $5 billion of equity. Furthermore, we saw the US airlines receive $21 billion of loans and grants from the government to cover their employees' salaries and benefits as stipulated per the PSP. The remaining $4 billion under the PSP will be allocated during the current quarter. So we now estimate that the industry's total liquidity, which we define as cash and marketable securities plus undrawn lines of credit at the end of the June quarter was 67 billion, which in our estimation should support operations for another one and a half years, assuming no improvement to current rates of cash burn. So as a result of this unprecedented capital raise, we now think insolvency risk is off the table at least through the end of the year, and even I would say into 2021. We talked about a year and a half. Now, we, I wanna stress though, or highlight the fact that we would be remiss if we also didn't highlight the fact that the industry's gross debt levels have also risen to a record high. We estimate that gross industry debt has increased from 105 billion to 144 billion since the spring. And that doesn't account for another 17 and a half billion tied to pension and other post-retirement benefits. We also wanna stress on this last point, um, because of the 50 billion that the airlines have received or are set to receive from the US government under the CARES Act, 32 and a half billion of it has to be repaid. That's not a bailout, that's a backstop. And it has to be repaid over the next five to 10 years, depending on which part of the program it's coming from. And we wanna mention that the remaining 17 and a half billion that they received that went directly into the pockets of US airline employees. Now switching back to Latin America, once airlines in that part of the world realized that government support was not forthcoming, they had no choice but declare insolvency and, declare, and seek bankruptcy protection, which is one of the reasons why many investors are now focused on Brazil where the COVID situation is as bad or worse than the US and the Brazilian airlines and government have been in intense negotiations regarding some form of assistance. So as of now, two of the publicly traded carriers have not filed and hopefully will not. The third, which is part of LATAM, that is LATAM Brazil, they recently filed for bankruptcy uh, within the last week or so. The fact that uh, regulators recently did not object to a code share and frequent flyer tie-up of Gol and Azul, which are Brazil's largest and third largest airlines, suggests to us that the government is open to self-help initiatives even if they appear on paper to potentially pose antitrust concerns. And I think it is interesting that maybe even beyond antitrust, Brian mentioned went under his question with respect to consolidation that maybe there is a potential merger there down the road between those two. Now, how do we go forward from here? Well, we're projecting industry revenues to return to 2019 levels by 2023. And I realize I'm a little bit different than what John was saying. I think John is of the view that volumes get there, but revenues lag by a few years. And that's probably a good, you know, something to discuss, discuss uh, over Q&A. Um, but even though we think it's gonna take four years to get back to 2019 revenues, 
The caveat here to investors is that the recovery will be an uneven one. That said, and this is just to reiterate an earlier point, we do believe that a recovery could be accelerated if an effective therapeutic and or vaccine were to become widely available. Now, in the meantime, you know, now that the airlines have ample liquidity, they can work through the complex, costly, and time-consuming process of right-sizing their operations for what they believe is the new normal. The goal is to get to break even on a cash flow basis with some airlines predicting that they are on track to get there by year end. If demand remains depressed at current levels, we doubt any of them will get there by then. We do believe that they need some help on the demand side, but not as much as one would expect given the increased variability of their cost structures compared to the airline industry of 30 years ago. There was a time when the industry adage of shrinking to profitability was nothing more than a death sentence because it couldn't be done. We believe that's no longer the case and have seen carriers go through the process over the past decade, albeit not on the scale that we are anticipating for the next several years. As we look across the landscape, we are expecting to see industry change and this would not be not be dissimilar from what we observed following past periods of disruption, such as 9-11 and the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. One thing we can say with pretty strong conviction is that the industry's costs are going up, which means over time, pricing is likely to go higher as well, which could have a dampening effect on future demand. Although we would be quick to add that in the near term, airfares are likely to be under pressure as airlines attempt to stimulate demand to entice travelers back to the airways and improve near-term cash flows. So with that, um, probably makes sense to stop. Go to Q&A. Thanks, Michael. That was a very informative. Um, and uh, to me, at least, it, it actually sounded positive. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm constructive on the group. It's all relative. Um, okay, so I think we, we're going to go to our. Oh, we need to. We may take one or two for uh, for Michael. Do we have anything, Mike Ball? Um, I'm just looking at the questions to see. Um, I don't know whether there's any specific to that. Uh, yeah, I don't see any questions specifically. To that, let me uh, let me just ask one here. Um, well, I, I have a quick one. John was showing five billion a month, of, I believe, in cash flow for the U.S. carriers. Uh, Brian took Brian had twenty billion um, worldwide, I believe, about twenty billion per month. Um, so if that's right, does that mean that the, the U.S. Uh, is accounting for about a quarter of the market worldwide? Do I have that right? Well, when you say a quarter of the market, uh, it's a quarter of the cash burn. A quarter of the cash burn. Um, yes, assume, assuming we're, I mean, cash burn is a little bit of a, Everyone d defines it a little different. Even every carrier defines it a little. So you know, give or take with the standardization of the definition. But uh, mine's a pretty inclusive approach. So um, yes, the short answer: one fourth of world cash burn. Mike, did you have anything you want to go? No, uh, actually, my question is really for the group. Maybe we should move into the. Uh, let each panelist say a few things and then we'll move into general questions for everybody. So why don't we start with Susan, if you want to say a few things and then, uh, um, you know, you can ask uh, some following questions to what you say. Um, so for me, my, my background is just a little bit different. What's interesting is, you know, with asking the question of what's going on right now and what will the airline industry look like in the future. What's interesting to me is, um, a lot of the presentations have focused in on the last, you know, four or five months, but actually um, through my extensive research on the recession in 2008, we're seeing a lot of similarities as to what happened 12 years ago versus now. So for example, um, low cost carriers tend to keep their market and decrease flight frequency versus major carriers are the opposite. And we see that Southwest is not filing exemptions to their markets. Um, we also see with ancillary fees, 
um, very similar things are happening with the recession. So uh, as compared to the 2008 recession. So I know that we're kind of uh, behind on time, um, but I do want to point out that like, um, while a lot of these presentations do focus in on one year of data, there's a lot to come out of 12 year old data as well on this topic that can really direct what's going on in this industry. Um, I don't have any particular questions on um, Michael's presentation, although I do see one in the chat. It said, which business model is likely to do better, point to point or hub and spoke? I, you know, I was just going to say in the near term, it's, it's going to be, right now the focus is going to be point to point. I also think it's going to be domestic and more leisure focused. And so that's why you're seeing the low cost carriers do a better job in holding on share right now. It, I mean, the international markets, it's been pretty well established that they've gotten hit pretty badly, as well as corporate. And when we look at the numbers, I mean, Delta recently indicated that corporate travelers represent 25 to 30% of their volume, but roughly double their revenue. So we're looking at, you know, 50 to 60% of their revenue, where, you know, the, you know, number of corporate travelers, it's, it's de minimis. So they've taken a big hit there. So the ULCCs and the LCCs, you know, they're, they're in their wheelhouse right now. And the fact that fares are low, if you have low costs, you lose less money, or maybe you even make some money. So you have much better staying power. So what we saw after 9-11, and to your point, Susan, after 08 and 09, um, you know, we saw those models hold on to more share. But, you know, under these circumstances, it almost seems like it's going to be accentuated because of the, the you know, sort of, you know, COVID-19 and, and the characteristics and what it, you know, what travel patterns it's attacked mm -hmm. most disproportionately. So if you're a domestic leisure focused ULCC, you're in the best position. And on that note, I would say that the first airline that is able to get back to, you know, break even on a cash flow basis is a legion. And I think that they'll end up doing it possibly sometime, maybe third quarter, early fourth quarter. I mean, they're at the point where they're burning now less than half a million dollars a day, which is on a 30 day period, you know, you're not, you're not talking about a lot per month. So, you know, that's predominantly, I mean, they're called a hundred percent leisure. They're ultra low cost. And I think it helps that 80% um, of their markets, they're the only game in town and they're a hundred percent domestic U.S. And keep in mind, Allegiant is not known for its massive seat pitch. But there, there are a lot of people who want that product. Yep. I think people fail to miss that. It's, a, it's, a, it's an offering, it's a choice. If you want a premium economy, buy it. The other thing I'd say, I agree with uh, Mike on all that. I would also say, you know, on point to point versus hub and spoke, I don't think in our lifetimes we're gonna see non-stops between Peoria and Prague or Richmond and Tokyo. So, you know, depending on your O&D, you are going to need a hub to get there. And I think what's going to change is airlines might route you through a different connecting hub based on how it's performing on local traffic. And some of that now is, is tied to how different states that own those hubs are performing on COVID. So I think those are all uh, factors, but I, but I agree with uh, Mike's take on everything. Take a slightly different angle to Susan's question, was that, which was that, you know, with similarities to the 2008, 2009 uh, crisis, because I think there are some important differences because traditionally coming out of a recession, airlines have uh, priced low to stimulate uh, de demand uh, and that's worked. Um, but what we're finding from the surveys is that I think there's a confidence challenge here with passengers as well. You know, passengers need to know that flying is, is safe. Um, they need to have some, so there's a, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that um, pricing to stimulate demand is going to work in the way that it has in the past. And the second difference is that um, actually airlines are facing higher costs particularly if they're required, you know, if they're required to keep the middle seat empty, they've already got slower turnaround times, you know, very low utilization, both of the aircraft and the seats. So those unit costs. I mean, we did some, we ran some numbers and unit costs could be doubled um, by some of these, these restrictions. Um, right. And I, I will say like the recession is obviously not identical to COVID, but when I'm talking about revenue management side, we are seeing very similar things in terms of ancillary fees, where in the recession, ancillary fees, baggage fees, 
were increasing and so customer protection issues came up and were not passed back in you know the recession time we saw that when cares was being drafted up they almost put consumer protections as to regards to needing to put the ancillary fees on the online travel agencies um, which it didn't end up in the final cares act but we're seeing history repeat itself on that aspect as well within yeah, I mean, the u.s i mean the thrust of the cares act was to protect airline jobs and and what's going to maximize airline employment is the flexibility to respond to the marketplace as they see fit and if that means uh i mean people forget these charges they're they're separation of the products right and they also resulted generally if you pay for a meal you get a better meal if you pay for bags you generally get better bag delivery and we saw that happen over time um i mean the key is that you know, some will still offer something bundled and some unbundled. But I think the reason, the main reason it came out of the CARES Act is because uh, the, the best way to maximize employment is to better their financial situation. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's something we'll face again this fall and in the coming years. But, um, you know, it is the a la carte models that have enjoyed the most rapid popularity and growth around the world uh, over the past 10 years, really, since 2007. Good. Okay, uh, why don't we go to Lori. Lori Garrow, you want to say a few things and maybe ask a question? Yeah, of course. Thank you, Michael. Um, so I think most of my comments are really reinforcement of um, what the other panelists have say. Uh, what I'm going to preface this by saying is that many of the information that I'm going to provide here comes from a conference that Aggie Fours ran in early June on airline operations and really gave the perspective of the airlines from the first hundred days of dealing with COVID. Um, what they found was that, of course, that first hundred days, they couldn't get to rock bottom, meaning it was just they would cancel flights and need to cancel more flights and cancel more flights because of this significant decrease in demand. Um, and, you know, one of the panelists that we had basically said, you know, we know how to cancel or park a fleet, right, in times of crisis for an earthquake, um, hurricane coming in, et cetera, but we've never had to park a fleet for this long and this many. So um, it was really looking at how we're going to navigate um, the fleet, park it, um, find spaces for it. Many of them moved to what they're calling an active preservation mode on the fleet. So while they did retire um, some of the older aircraft, um, right away under the expectation that they're going to come out smaller. Um, they are rotating a lot of the aircrafts. In other words, I pull in, um, let's say a 737, and then I don't use that for the next flight. I basically rotate it out with another one that's at the airport. That's allowing them to preserve engine time, um, engine maintenance, and defer a lot of the heavy maintenance, um, so minimizing some of the costs going in. The other thing is, is if you have your demand decreased by 95%, um, you got to find other sources of revenue, particularly if your country says no international flights. Um, and like Copa Airline, you're an airline that only flew international flights. Um, so a lot of the carriers were moving towards cargo only flights as well as repatriation flights. For the cargo flights, one of the things I thought was interesting was that um, some of the carriers were getting permission to basically transport the cargo in the cabin itself. So strapping the cargo on the seats, putting it in the overhead bins, um, getting special permission to do that, which was increasing some of the cargo capacity. So that goes in line with some of what Brian noted, um, but it's, I would argue it's not just always the belly in this part the carriers were looking at, um, but also the, the normal cabin. Um, all of the carriers really noted a focus on cast preservation. So if you look at Delta's investor call yesterday, they basically noted that they've got about 19 months of cash, um, you know, on hand at current burn rates. Um, but the other fact that they mentioned that to me was interesting was that in 90 days, they went from a cash burn of 100 million down to 27 million. You think about what that takes to pull down a cash burn um, on that level, um, you know, clearly not keeping up with demand. Um, but again, sort of gives an indication of, I think, what the carriers have been doing. Um, and then again, we just, we saw a lot of consistency with, there's a lot of differences among the carriers internationally, Latin America being hit um, a lot um, with bankruptcies, um, just due to the different levels of government support. 
Um, and if I want to end with, I think, uh, before I ask my question, there was one question that said, is there anything creative that carriers can do to stimulate demand? And uh, there was a fact that came out from our conference I thought I'd like to share, and this is Air Canada. So I'm going to read this. Air Canada has a fleet of aircraft that has 58 seats. They're using it or did use it for the NHL hockey teams. So what they've done is since they're not flying around, you know, the, the hockey team, they redeployed those aircraft on their rapid air shuttle service between Montreal and Toronto and Ottawa and Toronto. So if you want to fly the aircraft that the NHL hockey team does, you can basically do this right now, um, you know, if you can make your way to Canada to take those flights. So I thought that was a creative way to stimulate demand. And I think my question for the panelists is um, sort of a question we're seeing coming out is as we're looking at the airline coming out smaller, um, do you think there's going to be a different mix or a different priority of um, airline passengers versus cargo moving forward? So is cargo basically going to get more of a focus moving forward than maybe we've seen in the past? I can respond to the cargo ahead, question. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's a, a very good point. Um, certainly car cargo has been you know, a, a much bigger share of, of revenues uh, recently, partly because uh, passenger revenues uh, are, so, are so weak. I also think, I think that, you know, while we're going to see a slow recovery in air travel, partly because of the, the virus situation, um, cargo is likely, I think, to recover much more, much more strongly. Um, you know, a lot of the cargo traffic, some of the cargo traffic has been around you know, PPE and, um, and pharma pharmaceuticals, but you know, typically at the start of an economic upturn, you get a big surge in air cargo volumes as firms start to restock. Um, and you know, air cargo normally does quite well, so it's likely, to, I think, to do better sooner. Um, and so certainly for the next, you know, having really sort of fallen down in terms of share of airline revenues. I think cargo is going to be more important, at least for the next uh, couple of years, you know, maybe 20%, you know, possibly 25% of uh, revenues. Thank you. I mean, for an individual airline, it can be, right now, it can be critical. I think Sun Country in particular is a good example of an airline that uh, adapted quickly and is operating a number of 737s for Amazon. And uh, that's been absolutely crucial to them in, in this environment. I mean, longer term, I, I think there are some airlines who, um, you know, hire really well seasoned air cargo professionals to run their cargo operations and others tend to shuffle execs through more as part of their career development. and. Um, you know, maybe the opportunities here, I mean, they're, they're limited because the past proved that operating a dedicated freighter business was very challenging as a, as a multi-year sustainable entity for a passenger airline. But certainly optimizing belly cargo, you know, there are opportunities to do better there. And, you know, clearly it doesn't have the same risk aversion issues that passengers do with, with respect to health. So, um, you know, you just have the limited capacity of, of the bellies. I don't, I don't see freighter businesses as coming back. I mean, that was a thing in the nineties. Um, I don't know, Mike, if, what do you think? Or you way know, back I, I, was, I worked, I had a, a client in the, in one, one of my first jobs where it was very air cargo operating out of JFK. This was like in the seventies. <laughs> 70. Yeah. Um, is there, Go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that, you know, if you look at many of the long haul cargo flights that are being operated by the U.S. carriers where they're using passenger aircraft, the minute they actually get above a 40 or 50 percent load factor, then all of a sudden the cargo business doesn't work anymore. So some of these 777, 300 ERs, LA, Hong Kong, which United is currently flying, the Chicago, Hong Kong flight that's coming back in September. These, what United has publicly said, and I'll use them because they, as John, you alluded to companies that have, you know, good cargo managers at the helm. And I would say United is probably among, you know, the top in the U.S. industry. They have indicated that the majority, if not all of their long haul flights that they're operating today 
have been driven by, by the cargo demand, not passenger. But as soon as that passenger starts to pick up, they're going to switch over. So to your point, John, I just I don't see them moving into dedicated freighters. I think it's more out of necessity, and it's also an opportunity, and they're taking advantage of it. And I do think that I think everybody on this call knows that once carriers like Emirates and Etihad and Qatar Airways ramp back up, you know, across the Atlantic and into the right. big markets, you're going to see a lot more belly capacity come on. And we're already starting to see cargo yields come down pretty meaningfully over the last few weeks. So you're already starting to see that excess capacity start to, to dampen those returns. But for now, it's, it's been nice. It's, it's been good business and it's, it's been profitable business for, for some of the carriers. I assume uh, putting cargo in the passenger cabin and the seats and the overheads is a real niche um, thing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's... Yes. <laughs> I, unless you tell I, us when your next flight is, we'll put some around you, Joe. Really? <laughs> You can put, yeah, because I, I, I know you could put cargo in the middle seats, you know, that would be you you out of your middle Everybody seat. wins, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess, uh, Joe, yeah. we have to... Nice Limburger. <laughs> Limburger cheese. Yes, Mike. You want to move on to our last, those, that last question you had? Yeah, so I wanted to pose a, a, a final closing question to our three um, speakers, guest speakers. Um, what can governments do other than providing cash to improve the outlook for the airlines? Get a handle on COVID, number one. Um, uh, keep doing that great work you're doing, improving our air traffic management system. Keep up the great work. Uh, and do no harm, right? We've got a lot of proposals, state, local, federal, inter international, for things that would exacerbate our cash burn. That's not helpful. So we're already in a big hole. Help us dig our way out of it uh, by getting a you know public health under control. Uh, improve our infrastructure. Um, you know, increase, you know, automation, whether it's TSA, customs, FA, all that stuff's good and do no harm. Those are my three answers. I don't have three answers, but I would say, um, John, just a more nuanced on, on the government piece about getting COVID under control. What, what is really hurting bookings are, it's this patchwork of quarantines, you know, popping up left and right around the country. And it's not just states, it's cities like Chicago. If we could, from a federal level, take an approach and come up with some sort of metric or system? Is it 10%? Is it a positivity rate? Right now, the states are shooting from the hip. There's no consistency, number one. And then number two, you know, looking at the TSA and saying, all right, are there ways that we can employ them at the airports to either take temperatures or anything that improves confidence and, and, and sort of peace of mind with respect to travel. To go back to Brian's point earlier that, you know, you can lower the fares as low as you want them to be to try to stimulate mm -hmm. demand. But if people are afraid to get on an airplane, they're not going to fly. So that's kind of a more nuanced on just many of the things that you brought up, John. And they're also not going to fly if there's nowhere to go. If, if <laughs> Disneyland is closed, they don't just fly for the awesome ancillary meal that some one of our fellow panelists talked about. So it might taste really great, but I can go down the street to the restaurant to get it. I don't need to get uh, screened by TSA to get my sandwich. Brian, closing thoughts? Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with John. Yeah, it's, it's, it's health. This is a health crisis. Um, we, we, need to get, um, we need to get the uh, coronavirus uh, under control. Um, and, and also, it's, it's de you know, the, the passengers travel door to door so the end destinations need to be safe as well and I think governments can play a role in helping to raise confidence you know, the survey suggests that information um, is, uh, is, is, is needed as well as you know consistency uh, of, of applic application uh, I guess what we don't want to end up with is the situation that we did after 9-11 which was a whole set of very different regulations around the world, um, many of which we're still, um, uh, you know, having to comply with, perhaps um, not necessarily uh, for good reasons. Thanks, Brian. 
Hold more webinars. That's number four. <laughs> it's... Oh, well, right. You're going to. Hopefully, we'll be able to get together live. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think uh, we've come to the end of our time. And um, I, I, we, we thank you all for coming to this webinar. We hope you found it informative. Uh, we will have, there's going to be at least four of them once a month. The next one will be in mid um, August, and it will be um, on airports. So uh, we will send all of you an invitation to that. Um, so that's all for me. And Joe, do you want to say goodbye as well? That's all. Thanks all for coming and uh, stay tuned for our, our next one, as, as Michael says, on a different perspective, the airport's perspective. Okay, take care, everybody. Thanks. Uh, pleasure. Bye. Yep. Thank you.